Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind marketing strategy. One that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Today, we also have Bianca Harmon on the show, who's one of our direct consumer marketing strategists. Welcome to the show, Bianca. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Drew. Excited to talk with Josh today and learn about these incredible wineries out in the Walla Walla, Washington area. Yes, yes. Today we have Josh McDaniels. He's the CEO and director of winemaking for Bloodsoe Wine Estates in Walla Walla, Washington. Josh, he oversees the wine business that has three wineries, Doubleback and Bloodsoe Family Winery in Walla Walla Valley and Bloodsoe McDaniels in the Willamette Valley. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for having me. It's been, uh, you know, Bianca and I, Got to catch up uh, been, been a few weeks ago now, but uh, excited to have this conversation and talk a little bit about what we're doing. Yes, absolutely. So, Josh, what's the, what um, got to kind of start off and say, how did you kind of get your start in the wine business? Yeah, it's always a, a totally backwards answer. I actually started uh, my own winery when I was in high school in Walla Walla. Oh, yeah, much. My mom would have preferred anything other than the alcohol industry, but I was uh, kind of a young entrepreneur and not, honestly, just <clears throat> brutal honesty kind of found a way, was trying to find a way to make money. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was wine and uh-huh. uh, and uh, started my own winery and ran it for a number of years and, and uh, things kind of grew uh, through that. In high school, that's amazing. What, um, how did you figure out how to make wine in high school? Was it just so you could drink? It's, in addition, yeah, in addition to making money, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. You know, I hadn't had a lot of wine, but it was really just that kind of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial side. And uh, my dad had had a lot of small businesses growing up, and um, <clears throat> you know, I, I got in actually with the Figgins family who owns Lee and Eddie Sellers up here in Walla Walla. That's when sure. I was And uh, yeah, yeah. They well, they uh, you know, kind of took me in when I was a kid, uh, gave me a job, showed me the ropes a little bit, and I figured I could do it myself. And uh, you know, had had a modicum of success, and uh, certainly learned a lot. And actually, you know, it's funny. I graduated high school in 2007, and uh, then you know, 2008, 2009, financial crisis happened. uh, Right when I kind of had a growth spurt with the winery. And I got, you know, I got so much of a better education than I think I could have ever paid for or gotten a scholarship for in college. And uh, it was a, it was a great, <laughs> I can say that it was a great experience now in hindsight, but at the time, uh, just super challenging. And, you know, the, the amount of problem solving and, and grit that you had to have uh, to get through that was, was pretty cool. So uh, Drew and I met, who I work with now, uh, around that time, and, and obviously things grew and changed, and uh, got to utilize all that information that I had learned and experienced in, in the growing our wine business now. I got to ask, how did you and Drew meet? I mean, this... Yeah, yeah, so Drew, you know, I always say Drew was the, you know, he's, he's older than I am, which I like to remind him of. But he was the mythical, you know, godlike figure that every young boy in Walla Walla, you know, aspired to be. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, I was working for the Figgins family at the time and had my own winery. And, you know, he re- announced his retirement from the NFL and then said he was going to launch a wine project in Walla Walla, where, you know, Walla Walla, he grew up in Walla Walla, it's his hometown. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, you know, that's great. Seems like a great guy. He uh, obviously good at football. I've heard a lot of good things about his reputation, but (laughs) what what the hell does he know about making wine? What the hell does he know about the wine industry? And it was, it was cool to see what he did, but he hired uh, my mentor, Chris Figgins, who was a winemaker and and second generation at Leonetti. 
as the original winemaker. Mm. And uh, so the Drew and I met while I was at Leonetti and uh, uh, you know, what, uh, like eight years, seven, seven years later, I got to take over the brand. And it was uh, mm. at the time, I think I was 26 when I took over. I don't think he realized how young I was. I don't know if he would have given me the job if, if he had, <laughs> but I uh, got to take over. I was 26 and we hit it off and just have had a, you know, a great, a great run and a, have developed a great friendship now today. <clears throat> You've now co- collectively have three wineries, correct? Yeah. Which is crazy to think about, you know, we, I think uh, we were just together over the last, we spent a lot of time together over the last week and we kind of joke that we have you know, like professional ADD mm-hmm. where, you know, it's always trying to challenge each other and trying to, you know, push each other to new heights and, you know, obviously you don't get to the go to the NFL and, and do really well in the NFL if you're not very competitive. And then I think because I was so young and, and you know, I wasn't, you know, coming from a wine family, you know, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder and, and probably still do. So I had a lot to prove and just, you know, a lot of, you know, that competitive drive within me too. And so we just push each other and keep, you know, developing new things. And as long as we never – sacrifice an ounce of the success that we've gotten within the existing brands and wines, then, then we're going to keep, uh, keep pushing forward to, to do, you know, new and, and better things. Sure. How did the three brands come about? <laughs> yeah. So double back was started in 2007. That was the original, uh, winery. It's mm-hmm. uh, it was an estate grown Cabernet Sauvignon project. That's it. You know, it started off with one wine, uh, now we have uh, four wines under that um, winery, uh, two basically two Cabernets, uh, a Merlot, and then a tiny, 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 tiny amount of Chardonnay that we make under that. Um, Ten years later, you know, Doubleback has had grown into this allocated, you know, waiting list mm-hmm. project that had seen a lot of success. And you know, both of us, I think, being Walla Walla boys. Mm-hmm not coming, you know, he, you know, obviously he made a lot of money and, and I've had some success in, in wine and, and, um, uh, but neither of us had money growing up. You know, my dad worked at the cannery in Walla Walla, worked the night shift and, and his parents were both teachers, uh, in Walla Walla growing up. And it meant a lot to us that, you know, we weren't just selling, you know, $150 Cabernet that was allocated on a wait, waiting list. So we launched blood so family winery as a little bit more of an inviting uh project where you know our friends could come you know and our our, our you know our childhood friends could come enjoy a glass of syrah or cabernet or rosé or whatever it is and you know they didn't have to make an appointment they didn't have to be on the mailing list and and they could afford it you know and mm-hmm. so it was a uh, it was kind of a uh, almost like a personal project of ours to get into that and and that was launched uh in 2017. Mm. And then, um, you know, Bloodsome McDaniels came about a couple of years after that. You know, Drew and I had, had gotten this, you know, really great relationship and had grown this business together, um, you know, to a pretty solid place. And so we decided to partner together on a project down in what was this, you know, incredible place that we, we had, you know, a lot of love and affection for in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Uh-huh. So sure. we're thing on uh, Pinot Noir down there and, and it's a still a very new project mm-hmm. uh, we launched our first uh, wines in uh, 2000 uh, fall of 2019 and uh, it's just been a ton of fun but you know we've had some we had, have had three great extremely great successful releases and then ran into some wildfires uh, yeah. 2020 and decided not to make any wine in that vintage. So very challenging, but at the same time, extremely rewarding and, and, uh, exciting. So yeah, that's long story short, but the three brands kind of proliferated in that. that Yeah, no, that sounds very organic the way it came about. I do have, I do have to ask how's, what's this latest update with this 2022 vintage in the Willamette? (laughs) Yeah. You know, (laughs) on the whole Northwest far between Walla Walla and Willamette, it's uh, very wet and very cold. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's still time. We're just starting to see bloom here in Walla Walla. Uh, I'm going down to Willamette in a couple of days to check on our, our sites down there. But yeah, it's just wet and cold so far, but it's not the wettest or the coldest that we've ever seen. So I'm, I'm still okay. very optimistic that, that we'll, you know, adjust and, and make some changes and tweaks in farming and still continue to make some really fantastic wines. 
Yeah, I had no idea that it went up to Walla Walla to the coldness. But I re- we talked to another winemaker a few a month or two ago about that um, hailstorm or freeze that you got right during bud break. Did- yeah, it's you know it's just so weird. You know, the end of end of 2019 we had fall frost events in eastern mm-hmm. Washington. In 2020 we had uh, wildfires across the whole West mm-hmm. Coast. And then 21 was the hottest vintage on record, uh, you know, beautiful in Willamette, but just like half the crop of, of normal in Walla Walla. Mm-hmm. And so now it's just like, you know, now we get these uh, spring frosts that roll in in 2022 mm-hmm. and, and we're just begging for, you know, just some normalcy. <laughs> you know, Mother yeah, Nature, she's thrown everything she has at us and we're just, uh, it's hurting, but it, it's, you know, I tell my staff and our, and our sales team, it's like, you know, that's what's so romantic about the wine industry is every vintage has its own story. And, you know, these are the things that we get to talk about. And and Drew likes to say, you know, you don't sit back, you know, when you're when you're older and joke about the games when you were, you know, up by 40 points. Uh-huh. We want to talk about the games when we were down, you know, by a, by a couple touchdowns and came back and kicked some ass. And that's just how these these uh, last couple of vintages have been where, you know, we've been, uh, you know, stretched a little thin and, and uh, you know, we've just continued to make some really great wines. That's a great analogy. I love that because um, it is I, when back when I was selling a lot of wine, if I really love selling Barolo and there was like yeah. one out of every two or three years was it was a good one. And then they then they got the string where it was like six years of great Barolo and the, the story got a little monotonous <laughs> another good year another good year and it's really hard if you're selling the same then it becomes very productized where just like you said it's much more fun to talk about the people that overcame the adversity or they dealt with it or they used the adversity to their advantage totally you know i love for the first off i love barolo so i'm glad you brought barolo up but it's uh you know we always you know we've always thought that you know like the last the coldest vintage on record was 2011 and that wine's drinking incredible right now. I mean, we love drinking that wine and, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, hard years, find great producers and, and you'll still find, you know, just greatness within, you know, and, you know, it's, it's weird these days, the way critics evaluate things and, and you got to remember that, you know, what you're in it for. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what, I got to, what motivates you to make the wines that you make? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, a few years ago, Drew and I sat down and we actually developed like our core purpose in business and which is, you know, a, a not romantic way of evaluating a winery, right? Like mm-hmm. nobody ever wants to talk about business in the wine industry, but you know, it's, it, it we got to a point, I think where it was like, what are we doing? You know, are we just making booze or are mm-hmm. we, you know, trying to pretend like we're something we're not, um, What's, where's the where's the value and the and the reason that brings us like true fulfillment in in this industry, and our core purpose ended up being uh, to create genuine happiness for our customers and ourselves, mm-hmm. and so it has nothing to do with wine, but wine just ha- happens to be the medium where we you know br- try to bring happiness into other people's lives, and that honestly that really you know inspires me to do more with with what we're trying to do and trying to make great wines. We're trying to, you know, you know, like three years ago, we started a farming company where we have our farm team is, is uh, we made a commitment to have them be one of the highest paid uh, farm crews in the Northwest. They have full health insurance, full retirement benefits and get paid year round, you know, the, changing people's lives internally. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you, we get these stories that come across our, whether it's our inboxes or, um, you know, through word of mouth or whatever, but like places like actually this morning, I had a guy, one of our good customers texted Drew and I and said, Hey, you know, I just wanted you to know that my dad passed away last night and we're opening, we opened a bottle of double back, uh, to remember him with, you know, and that stuff hits you hard. You know, that's when, when the romance of the wine industry becomes a hell of a lot more than just about scores and points and it becomes real life and you can't replace that stuff. And I think, you know, those kinds of situations, whether it's uh, enhancing someone's life financially or whether it's enhancing someone's life, you know, through the product itself, it's uh, you can't get any better than that. And I think that's what continues to inspire us to do better. I love that. I worked in the wine industry for a long time and I've always said it's like, you know, there's there's a true 
sense of self or anything like when you build these connections with these people from the wine and like they message you and they tell you like hey i'm just thinking about you and they don't it could have been four years ago you know and they're like pulling out that bottle and you're who they think about because of that experience or that wine or that's what it's all about at the end of the day yeah and you can't buy that stuff or or right it's real you know organic emotion that's brought out because of the product that you're trying to create it's pretty cool yeah that's great so do you think that you i mean this is kind this might be a little off the wall but being part of the blood so does that drew being who he was does that bring in customers or guests do you think has that been a, a big part in who you guys are or for sure especially you know the the you know the foundational years you know the first like five years of the business that was really core to the success of it um now you know you can't sell you know shitty wine for you know 100 bucks a bottle and and a bunch of it you know maybe you'll be able to you know trick a few people into doing that (laughs) but certainly it's it was uh you know i always said it was it was important for like the first like two million in business Mm -hmm. and then then you know that was pretty much the ceiling and then you got to you know remember what you're doing and what you're trying to do and and then focus on that and you know one of the things i loved about drew is he he didn't name you know it's not drew blood so winery that he started out Mm -hmm. with you know it wasn't super ripe 200 percent new american oak kind of style of cabernets Mm -hmm. um you know, and I love that. And he started off, he bought, the first thing he did was buy a piece of property, not, you know, buy some bulk wine, slap his name on it, like a oh. Nike shoe uh, mm-hmm. endorsement. And so he, he started off that way, which I love. And then, you know, we've actually, you know, this weekend we had our release party for Double Back. And I heard, heard this a number of times, you know, people come, they, people said, you know, we come, we came because of Drew, but we stayed mm-hmm. because of Josh. <laughs> and I, and I, uh, I, you know, selfishly appreciated that a lot because I think it's pretty true where I've always thought that, you know, Drew's name opens doors, mm-hmm. but it's our job to close them. And, um, and it's our job to say, and back it up, you know, and it's our yeah. job to say, you know, we're making, we're going to make, we are making great Cabernet. We're doing it in different ways and we're doing uh, different things within the winery that mm-hmm. make us stand apart also. So this isn't just, you know, and I never want to be something like Camus, you know, I never want to be, you know, uh, you know, there's especially, you know, back in the mid 2000s when Drew started, <clears throat> there was a lot of, you know, a, there was a few celebrity, you know, athlete kind of wine projects, but none of them were very good. Mm-hmm. And so to try to break through that stigma, um, after a while, it kind of works against you in a lot of ways. Yeah, parts. I was thinking about that. There's actually like a little bit of a stigma, like, oh, here's another celebrity slapping his name on it yeah yeah i mean especially you know especially with uh kind of the wine trade it's it's a challenge you know you got to break through the the psalm that thinks he knows everything that mm-hmm. thinks like i don't want to carry drew bloodsoe's wine and, it, and you know as a, when i was a young wine geek i totally get that i thought this exact same thing i mean i started off by saying you know drew's a great football player he seems like a nice guy but what the hell does he know about making wine and that was, you know, and that's still a stigma that we have to break through. But certainly uh, at the beginning of the business, it, it helped kind of open those doors. Yeah, I think now his, his name's pretty solidified there. Is you, um, in your own winemaking style, if you look back at your high school self and you look at what you're making wine now, how has your winemaking evolved over the years? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is, you know, I've, I've really believed that as a winemaker, you can only go so far and then you kind of revert back to the vineyards. Mm-hmm. And so we've, you know, we've got uh, five different estate sites in Walla Walla, one down in the Willamette Valley and trying to, you know, make better wine through those sites and through farming rather than winemaking has been, I think the biggest, uh, mm-hmm. you know, change. And so like right now we're, we're doing, you know, major, um, work through, you know, cover crops and different ways of, of, of managing a canopy and, uh, you know, different ways of, of re- just, you know, simple things, uh, pragmatic things like uh, employee retention, mm-hmm. you know, rather than, you know, getting some turnover and, and having, you know, new hands working your, your vines every year, you're mm-hmm. having the same people doing it all the time and they know it better than anyone else ever could. So I think, you know, that would be 
you know, one of the biggest things, but also, you know, and, and people ask me all the time is, is like, <clears throat> shouldn't you just focus on making Cabernet and not go down and make Pinot Noir? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, a, that's been a question in the last few years. And, and I get where it comes from, but I, I honestly think, you know, Pinot Noir shows its faults so well, you know, in Cabernet, you can hide things in, in, you know, the bigness and the, and the roundness of it oh, sure. or, you know, new oak or whatever it is, but Pinot shows everything. And I think because we're, we've learned to fine tune things in Pinot Noir to be very precise and exact mm. and, and, you know, just nail it. And because you have to, it's gotten us to be better uh, makers of, of Cabernet too. And so you know, now we're very precise and exact in Cabernet and, you know, we don't have to, you know, rely on, on doing different things like that are, that are kind of fake. Like I think some producers do, or maybe some, you know, even things that I did, you know, when I was quite a bit younger too. Yeah. I have access to a lot more material now and be- better crops, just like you said. I think yeah. uh, Pinot wise too, you know, it's the, it's such a delicate grape. And I think, you know, not everybody can just make a Pinot. And so, but it seems to me that everybody can make a pa- a cab or thinks that they can, right? But all these people that just make a cab, they can't, you can't make a Pinot. There's so much more to it. Just the grape alone, the growing region, everything. And it really shows your expertise and knowledge in the industry when you are doing Pinot. Granted, Walla Walla's, I mean, Willamette Valley is an incredible area for Pinot, but just because it's a good area, not everybody can go in there and start making Pinot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's like, it's almost like that old saying about like white wine in general. It's like, it's easy to make white wine. It's really hard to make great white wine. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard that a lot. And I think, I think it's, it's probably pretty similar in, in this regard. And, you know, making Pinot Noir just pushes you to a different level. And that obviously falls across into the next silo in, in the Cabernet. You know, you can't, you compartmentalize, but you can't do it that much. It's uh, it's been pretty fun. And just a great. I've I've made Pinot Noir since 2011 when I was still working with the Figgins family. So it's not like you know I started a couple of years ago. It's been a lot a lot of fun and a ton of learning. Mm-hmm. So managing three brands between three different two different states, how do you how do you, do you keep them semi, just autonomous as three three brands each winery operating? autonomously or do you have some synergies and economies of scale there that you can leverage yeah quite a bit of synergy and economies of scale you know i wish you know in a perfect world i wish we had the money where we could have three separate teams Mm -hmm. but you know we one of the benefits of that i think too is just i have a you know whether it's production or sales or whatever you know i've i've gotten a great team that i just trust and you Mm -hmm. can't go by trust and, and, and understanding and, and, you know, and just synergy between, you know, personalities. And so we all, we manage everything, almost everything within the same team. There's a few outliers, but um, it's just been a, we actually like the Pinot, for example, we actually put the fruit into refrigerated trucks and, and uh, truck it up to the Walla Walla, which is about four hours away. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we actually bring it into that team's production area thus so we can manage it uh, with the same set of eyes that we make double back and blood. So family with. Okay. Yeah. So that they're made at the same facility and under the same guidance that, that helps a lot, I would think. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. And just, you know, it cuts down on my travel. It cuts down on, you know, the, the, you know, overhead for, you know, building another winery and, mm-hmm. and, and whatnot. And, you know, one thing that we've always focused on too is, you know, we've never wanted to like go out and spend a ton of money and just have these beautiful facilities that everyone just thinks we're just successful overnight because of our want beautiful wineries. Mm-hmm. Our, our one winery in Walla Walla looks like an old barn and it's mm-hmm. just extremely functional. You know, it's function over form made to make great wine and that's it. It's not just this uh, Taj Mahal that Drew can come in and stamp his name on. It's a real, winery that's trying to you know be successful off the off the quality of the wines Mm -hmm. do all do all your wineries allow visits they do yeah um we're trying to get established down in the willamette valley on our on our property down there so that's kind of the one outlier that's not you know fully up and running but uh, we have uh double back which is the only tasting room for double back is Mm -hmm. at the winery and there's a, a wine lounge in Walla Walla for Bledsoe Family Winery. And there's a wine lounge in Bend, Oregon uh, for Bledsoe Family Winery, too. Which oh, really? is, okay. 
Yeah, super fun. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. As far as your sales, are most of it directly to consumers, or are they? Um, do you distribute out through the three tier system? Yeah, we do some distribution. It's about overall, it's about eighty five percent direct to consumer, though. So mm-hmm. still quite a bit, uh, you know, shipped, you know, ordered online or over the phone or an email and shipped right direct to our customer, uh, which we love. <clears throat> um, but you know, we we are in you know small allocations about of about thirty states. Uh, most of that goes through kind of the coast, like Washington, Oregon, California, then New York, Massachusetts, and Florida. Those are those are kind of the big, you know, six states that, that we distribute in. So are you doing it? Are you distributing mostly restaurants or is it stores or? Yeah, mostly restaurants. So a lot of, you know, on-premise consumption, um, you know, higher end restaurants, which obviously, you know, was a challenge in 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, they they seem so far, we've been pretty pleasantly surprised with how a lot of people have bounced back. And um, so that's, you know, most of that. And then a little bit through, you know, off premise uh, wine shops and, and, you know, grocery stores and whatnot, too. Kind of going back to like the wine, I, I know that it's something that you uh, is important to you. And I kind of wanted to talk about was your sustainability practices and what your what you're doing, what's important to you, what you guys do differently that you think sets you apart from others in the industry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all, you know, especially right now, it's a big, you know, talking point. It's gotten, you know, kind of greenwashed, I think too, with, with a lot of corporations jumping on the bandwagon, but, you know, obviously, you know, to, uh, you know, the first one, it's kind of three things for us, which is, you know, the one is, is financial, you know, to be honest. And, and I remember, one of my first college professors told me, you know, hey, you know, Josh, it doesn't matter if you like to make wine, if you can't afford to do it, mm-hmm. you know, and that was always a, a really good slap in the face, especially when I was younger. But um, and I think I bring that up because it's important to be financially sustainable, because if you're not in a good place financially, you can't do the other things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the other things being, you know, the environmental side of things, you know, we're we're enormously focused right now, which has been a huge, you know, kind of a big passion of mine in the last probably about year now is um, putting a lot of focus on lessening our water usage, mm. you know, water rights and, and water as a natural resource, um, enormously important moving into these warmer climates and, and mm-hmm. warmer vintages that we're seeing. So we're doing a ton of research and ton of, you know, trials and experiments on just simple things like cover crops, mm-hmm. uh, trying to develop, you know, and establish cover crops that keep water in the soil mm-hmm. and, you know, and keep plants and, and fix uh, nutrients and fix uh, different things that the plants can use to, and be a little bit more efficient in. Um, the other piece that, that we kind of touched on earlier already is the people part. Yes. <clears throat> I think, you know, like three or four years ago, this was really like overseen and and never mentioned. Like everyone thought sustainable farming was only about the environment. And Mm -hmm. while that's great, you know, it really, quite honestly, like three or four years ago, kind of pissed me off that nobody ever thought about the the people that are actually fucking farming. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And so, you know, that's when we set out on that mission to, you know, start our own farm team. And like I said, you know, make them one of the highest paid crews in the Northwest, full health insurance, retirement benefits. And, you know, so many uh, farms lay off their workers after eight or nine months. And we actually keep them fully employed uh, through the whole year. And that was it was really cool for us. Like we've like to joke that, you know, we would do we made that commitment because we wanted to make our moms proud of us. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty cool to see like the unintended consequences of that qualitatively in our wines too, where I remember, you know, in 2019, that first year we, uh, had a fall frost event, uh, October 9th, 2019. And our vineyards were in pretty good shape. So we had to kind of rush out our, a few of our neighbors needed help getting their fruit off the vine. Mm. And so we took our crew and helped, help them pick the fruit. And I remember our, our crew leader, Pedro, came out of the vineyard. He walked up to our vineyard manager and he goes, boss, you know, this vineyard looks like shit. Our <laughs> vineyard will never look like this. And it was, you know, it was, it was pretty funny. But at the same time, it was this, you know, like, like 
affirmation that we started a cultural paradigm shift where they actually care about what they're doing. You know, it's not, they took pride mm -hmm. in making our vineyards the best vineyards in the Valley because it was their vineyards. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't just another vineyard that they were contracted to go work on. They, they took ownership in it. And because we took care of them they they took, you know, maybe even better care of us. And so that, you know, shift was just enormous. And because we made that shift and it's within our sustainability pledge, it's been one of the biggest things that, that we could have done over the last few years. So it's sustainability means, you know, a few things to us and maybe different than what it means to other people. But it's just been a huge word, you know, within within our uh, three wineries and something that, you know, it's pretty irreplaceable at this point. Yeah, I love that you brought that you're bringing in employment and stability and um, human. I, that's the wrong word, but human stability into the equation because you spend too much time. I believe too much focus is put on the environmental side of it, and without the custodians in the in the vineyard, you kind of are missing the huge piece. So uh, yeah, totally agree. You know, and I know it's interesting. You know, and I hesitate to say this, but you know the there's been a lot of diversity and inclusion, you know, pledges over the last few years, which are really great. Um, but I remember, you know, when some of that in 2020 really started, I kind of got, I kind of got mad again because, you know, everyone was saying, well, our industry is all white people. And, mm -hmm. and once again, you know, I said, you know, wait a second, half of my business <laughs> is Hispanic mm -hmm. and they're an enormously important part of our business. And you just totally, you know, glossed right through them you didn't even acknowledge them and so totally. yeah it's just it's a frustrating thing and just you know the more spotlight that we can put on it i think the better my <clears throat> family growing up well they still do but they own a winery in napa and i, I live in Santa Elena. and he used to my uncle used to have and they were younger you know back then and this is you know this is in the late 80s 90s um but they were illegal they were illegal immigrants, um, but they would work for him. And if they, you know, worked hard, he would help them get become citizens. And so like the workers that work on my family's property, they've I've known them my, my entire life. I'll go eat at a restaurant and they're the same. And I'm like, they're like, I'm like, how's my uncle? And they're like, he's good, you know, and they've worked for him for over 30, 40 years. Yeah. And started as kids and he would help them become, you know, you worked hard, you do good for me. I'll help you become, you know, stay and, you know, because it was so expensive for these people to become legal immigrants too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's incredible. You know, and I love, I love that. I so, love that mentality and the culture too. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's just, they are, they are so important and it's like, it's totally grazed right over. Yeah, which is unfortunate. You know, it's a that's half of our comp our business. You know, it's right. just that piece of it, and it's just totally glossed over, like you said. And so, when you find the wineries that take care of those workers, it really makes a huge difference because otherwise, they're unemployed half the year. Yeah, and you know, it's been interesting. Like this year you know, where so many farms have been struggling to find labor, we're, we've been fine. You know, we, we have a, we have this, you know, we've, we, people come to us because, you know, we take care of people and, um, you know, we've got a couple second generation, um, you know, family members that are working for us now too, which, you know, that's incredible to see. Yeah. And so, yeah, that whole paradigm shift has just been, uh, you know, majorly instrumental in our success. Love to see that paradigm shift towards sustainable employment. And how, so also that kind of leads into Walla Walla itself is this area, a subset of the, you know, the U.S. wine industry. How has the area changed over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, both positively and negatively? Man, well, if you ask, uh, you know, I grew up here. And uh -huh. so I, I, uh, I think that I'm... <laughs> do you know to make fun of some of the old time wheat farmers around town yeah. but you know if you ask some of them they still hate it um, so there's the negative side but everything else i think has been positive uh you know we've got it's a town i think the city the the city's like 32 or thirty-three thousand people the county's like 60 
1,000 or something. So small town. You have one of uh, the best airports to fly into. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Really? 30 minutes before your flight and you're good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, it, I think, Bianca, did you say you're in Santa Rosa? Is that what you said? Santa Lena. So, but oh, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. 30 minutes from Santa Rosa. So. Yeah. Well, what is that? Charles M. Schultz Airport. So it reminds yeah. me of it's really funny. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So super easy to get in and out of, but you know, town of you know, small, tiny town, we've got, you know, James Beard chefs and just the incredible food scene, uh, the hospitality industry, like in terms of uh, hotels and, and, and uh, B and B's and whatnot are, are really starting to step up and man, like, it's just a beautiful area and it's always been that way, you know, regardless of the wine industry. But the other pieces, you know, restaurants and hotels and now golf and, and whatnot are really coming along, too. So it's just my wife, you know, I always say, like, I grew up here as a kid. I never thought I would stay in Walla Walla. But now, you know, my wife and I have, I have three young kids and it's just uh, the best place to come home to. And uh, we love living here. And it's just a, a really cool place that we feel fortunate to be in. So we all we do always tell everyone, like. If you haven't been here, please come because it obviously you have to experience it to believe it. And uh, like if you're in San Francisco, if there's a lot of traffic in Napa, you go to SFO. It's a it's an it's an hour, 15 minute flight. You might be here before you get to Napa. So um, it's a great place to come and visit. So and, and uh, you know, you'll save a ton of money um, in lodging and, and wine and whatnot along the way. So we'll, we definitely welcome that. Yeah, I was up there, I think the last time was two years ago, and I was really, right before the pandemic, I was really surprised at the infrastructure, and the food was fantastic. Yeah, that, it, forget the where we ate, but it was, yeah, I was very impressed. Yeah. It, it would make it, it would make it very easy to live there. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, I haven't been there, but I would like to. I'm actually, was just thinking, because you were saying that you had a, uh, a tasting room, I guess, in Bend? Yeah, have to. We're going to be making a trip at the end of um, July up to Portland. And Perfect. so I was like, wait, maybe I could at least hit the Willamette Valley area on the drive to Portland. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's like like 30 minutes from the airport. So you're you're right in wine country. If you make it over, let me know. We'll definitely uh, help. Uh, you know, we can fill an itinerary for you. It's it's that'd and, be great. And Willamette is beautiful. Also, Willamette is beautiful. Yeah, I've always wanted to go there. I, I just never I just clicked during this episode that Wilma Valley is right all the way there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When you said that it was four hours from Washington, I mean so I mean that has to be difficult. I mean, is weather similar in Wilma Valley and Walla Walla when you're like managing grapes and all of that? Are you dealing with at least similarities there or the weather so Walla Walla is quite a bit warmer and drier. Um, but the cool thing, like what we've always thought with this Bloods and McDaniels is, you know, there's obvious differences, right? The Willamette Valley, cold, it's mm -hmm. colder, it's dry or wetter, um, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, but there's also these really cool similarities that nobody talks about, you know, the, all the lava flows that originally, uh, formed both valleys are the exact same lava mm -hmm. flow. Um, people talk about the Missoula floods a lot, which, you know, kind of carved out the Columbia basin and then backed up into Walla Walla, you know, those same waters went down the Columbia river and then backed up into the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, I, we, when we bought our property, uh, last year, I was walking through the upper half of it and, you know, I'm looking down at my feet and it's the same exact basalt, you know, fractured basalt boulders that are in that vineyard that are in our vineyard up in Walla Walla at McQueen Vineyard. And so it's just, uh, there's obvious differences, but there's really cool kind of hidden similarities that really make it feel like home. And uh, it's almost like just making wine just with through a different lens of a, of a variety too. So yeah, come see us. We'd love to, love to have yeah. you. Definitely. Where do you see Walla Walla going in the next 15 years? Like, where would you like to see it? in an ideal world 15 years from now? What, what's Walla Walla look like? Yeah. You know, region. Yeah. Crystal ball. I mean, you hear the old, everyone say, you know, Walla Walla is like Napa, you know, 30 years ago. 
So, you know, you always hear about that. Um, I definitely think there's some merit to that California influence that's coming up. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, uh, the Jackson family, uh, you know, Chris Carpenter, the winemaker at uh, Cardinal and La Coya, mm -hmm. they're making wine at our place, actually, and uh, just bought some property, I think like a 80 acre piece of property in Walla Walla. Mm -hmm. um, seeing a lot of that kind of interest running around town, um, you know, these warmer, you know, vintages come and people are looking north. And so seeing a lot of that kind of outside the, the valley influence that's coming in. And a lot of people, you know, get scared about that, but mm -hmm. you know, we've always thought, you know, high tide rises all ships and the more competition you have, the more it'll push you to be better. And so, you know, we've embraced that. And I think that overall, that'll be a positive thing. And, and we're trying to, you know, foster those good relationships and, and help people, you know, do things the right way if we can. And um, so I think, you know, that's probably one of the big, you know, changes that'll happen over the next, you know, 15 years. Uh, people, larger companies coming in from California. What about international? I know in Willamette, there's a lot of French Burgundy producers teaming up. And just like in Napa, a lot of Bordeaux houses kind of moved in and got co-ownership. Are you seeing some of the international involvement in Walla Walla? Yeah, there's a, a little bit. You know, it's not quite still, you know, it's we just had this conversation. I still can't believe the Drew and family invested in Willamette like 40 years ago. You know, yeah. that's so weird to think. I don't know how they had that yeah. foresight. Um, <laughs> incredible family mm -hmm. but um you know obviously you know you saw like the bollinger uh, team and and uh louis Jadot and some, some of those investments going into willamette um we just had uh uh, uh valdemar bodega valdemar the what is it, the oldest winemaking family in spain yes it's like eight generations just uh built a you know great new beautiful winery facility here in walla walla um, and definitely a lot of that kind of movement that's that's being rumored around. So there's it's going to be a lot of parallels between the Spain and Walla Walla. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I, I'm kind of surprised there hasn't been more from Bordeaux. But at the same time, you know, being in Bordeaux, it's like it's got to be like an outside investor that bought into Bordeaux that then goes and buys in Walla Walla. Because I mm -hmm. think the Bordelais think that still don't think that wine is produced outside of Bordeaux. Um but, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously a lot of those wineries like, you know, Lafitte and whatnot are owned by banks anyways. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, that international I, is hard. I do find it fascinating how internationally the, the regions all seem to go to another region. Like all the Burgundy producers seem to go to Willamette. Yeah. Bordeaux went to um, Napa area. The Rome guys went down to Paso Robles for their um, for their investments. And then it makes sense. I guess it makes sense. So when Walla Walla got Spain, I guess St. Michelle's got a, a an Italian. Um, yeah, the Antonoris, they own, uh, I don't know what percentages, but they're big investors and owners mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of a property in Washington State, too. So, yeah, and, you know, like um, uh, um, Michelle Roland consults mm -hmm. on a project in Walla Walla. So there's definitely some of that influence. But, you know, you haven't seen something like, you know, Opus One kind of type of partnership yet. You know, it's uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But obviously that hasn't happened yet. One question I, I probably could look at a book, but I'd like to ask you anyways. So Walla Walla is one of the one Appalachians that actually spans two states. Yeah. Where you, yeah. Got, you got Oregon Walla Walla, you got Washington Walla Walla. How did is there a um, marketing difference on the two? <laughs> a lot of people are think so. Um, <laughs> we personally don't care at all. Um, you know, Walla Walla to us, uh, you know, the it's kind of like a. It, it, to me, it's almost intellectually boring to think about where the state line is, mm -hmm. and, and not just focus on Walla Walla. You know, we want to make when you're growing up here, you see the valley. You know, the the geological valley, mm -hmm. and that's really what we focus on. You know, there's like. Sean Sullivan, you know, I love the guy, but if he writes another damn article about Washington, <laughs> Oregon and Walla Walla, it's just like so boring to me. You know, it's just, I don't, I don't really understand the argument. Um, you know, it's just, I just, it's like a masters of wine kind of thing that, that they get stuck on and can't get over that hurdle. It's just a weird thing. But to me, you know, we just focus on the geological Walla Walla Valley and what makes those wines great. That makes a lot more sense to, to focus on the geographic rather than the 
state line. Yeah. Hmm. Well, gosh, Josh, as we're kind of wrapping down here, I got to ask, who do you respect most right now in the wine industry or who do you want to give a shout out to? Oh, man, such a hard, such a hard question. I mean, I've had so many great mentors uh, in my career, you know, Chris and Gary Figgins, so I, you know, kind of raised me in the wine industry. I uh, love those guys. And, you know, quite honestly, even, uh, um, you know, one of our friends, well, one of our friends, Greg Harrington, who's uh, a master sommelier. And then also, you know, um, this one is kind of unexpected, but we've just loved having uh, uh, Chris Carpenter up from uh, Cardinal and La Coya. They've been, mm-hmm. it's been really interesting to see, you know, a style change and a, and a different type of winemaking you know, come up and do something with, with fruit in the same region. And so it's been fun to, you know, learn from people and, and, uh, you know, and try to understand differences and see how we can all get better. So, yeah, super tough question. And Mm -hmm. because there's so many great people that I've been fortunate to, uh, to experience. Yeah. Yeah, Those are, yeah, it's, it's so good to surround yourself with such high, um, just different thoughts and just different types of different types of like influences. Yeah. You know, one of our, you know, core values is being open-minded and Mm -hmm. there's been so many times where I've been prepared to hate someone for something that I've heard about that I've absolutely loved them for. So, um, yeah, try to certainly try to keep an open mind. That's a perfect word of wisdom to end on. Josh, where can people find more about you? Uh, go, you know, go online. Just uh, bloodsowineestates.com. You can see all of our uh, three individual wineries there and then uh, shoot off to, to one of them to learn more about. Or, or uh, Right now, uh, everything's sold out, but Bloodsow Family Winery has a live shopping page uh, on that. So go check that out um, or join one of the mailing lists for the other two wineries. Get on the allocation list. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for joining Josh. us today. No, uh, thank you both. It's been uh, certainly fun and, and super uh, interesting to you know talk to you guys. And hopefully, uh, Bianca, when you get up here later this year, uh, we can show you around Willamette. Yes, I would love that, and my family would too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have a great day, Josh. You too. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Thank you.